Well, look, there's, there's a very easy way of being a skeptic about anything, and you find it in philosophy throughout history, which is that you define the thing you want to be skeptical about in a way that makes it impossible for it to be achieved. And then you celebrate the fact that it doesn't exist. And this happens with like free, free will, the self, and it happens with objectivity. And it's not a complete straw man. There is a certain notion of objectivity, which is that to be objectively true, it must be true in such a way that it has nothing at all to do. It's completely independent of any kind of perspective. It's like the God's eye view. And you know, to be fair, you know, Plato arguably did argue that perfect knowledge should be of that kind. He also argued that no one had it, of course. Um, so even he was acknowledging that it didn't exist, but he thought, he thought maybe we could get there. Um, but that's kind of, how could there be, I mean, Hillary talks about the perspectival nature of knowledge. And of course, there's no way human knowledge can ever completely escape from the limitations of our perspectives. But does that mean there's no sense in objectivity? I don't think so, and I'll, I'll, I'll refer to someone, a better philosopher than myself, Thomas Nagel, in his book, The View From Nowhere. The View From Nowhere is, of course, an ironic title. There is no view from nowhere. Every view is from somewhere. Perspectival nature of knowledge again. But Nagel says, look, subjective and objective are not these opposites. They're kind of ideal points on a spectrum. And your understanding becomes more objective the less it depends on the particularities of your own viewpoint. And that's why, in things like science, you can get a very, very high degree of objectivity. Because the equations of physics are true. There'd be, if, if, if an alien could understand those equations, they wouldn't have to have any of the same sense apparatus as us at all. They would still be true. Where certain truths, I think, I get these like race and identity, they're not like that. They're not, they, 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 they have a kind of inherent sort of subjectivity. They are more part of our social structures and our society and so forth. So as long as you sort of don't think that objective means completely free from any kind of hint of perspective, it just means it's kind of a direction to go towards. We can have truths which are more objective. And you kind of have to have that. If you give up on that idea, you are left with the morass of, of, of anything goes. And, and, and Leotard, I'll just read this from Leotard, actually. It's very interesting. He said that even uh, the Nobel laureate biologist Peter Medawar believed that there is no scientific method and that a scientist is, before anything else, a person who tells stories. So far, so anything goes. But he adds, the only difference is that he, the scientist, he, note that, um, is duty bound to verify them. So Leotard recognizes that in the, science, in the sciences, there is a need for verification, which means that your claims have a, I'd say, a greater objectivity. Now we've been nice and baggy about that session of questions, um, and we're gonna shorten this next uh, uh, one a bit because in a way it's kind of more observational and less philosophical. Um, and it is about the question about what the impact of postmodernism has been there. Do, Jules, you um, reflected a little bit on, uh, on that. Um, after hearing what you've heard, would you stick to the notion that postmodernist concepts, as they have been utilised, um, have been damaging? Now, I, I came across, um, because we've all had to kind of look at this stuff, a 1999 uh, rejection of Judith Butler by Martha Nussbaum, which in a way was kind of pointed forward to what it was that, was gonna, that she thought might happen and I have a suspicion that you would think that it has happened. Uh, yes, and it's interesting. I was reading that paper recently. I think it's the Professor of Parody. Yeah. Is that right? Um, and yes, I mean, I think it's had a terribly damaging effect on the academy, which then, of course, bleeds out into wider society and, and pre-postmodernism. Um, you know, our university's fem feminism um, was kind of taken over, to use an aggressive word, by feminist philosophers and feminist sociologists were pushed out of the you know, equation, which means that applied knowledge, so the knowledge that was previously um, disseminated by those feminists that were also activists, got things done, wanted their research to have an influence on law, policy, society in general, um, became, I think, really dominated by more abstract thought. And of course, there are specific um, aspects to Judith Butler's work that has led to a highly problematic erasure 
of the political category of women. Because if you, like me, recognize that women are a sex class, and men, of course, are a sex class, to, to erase woman as a category means that we can't actually achieve solidarity between women. And we're constantly looking at individual identities as though they somehow um, count for uh, structural oppression. So one brief example, asexuality, polyamory, right? In what way have asexuals or people in polyamorous relationships lost their housing, their families, or been beaten up on the street because of that individual identity? And so that, I think, is one of the results of, it's like identity politics, but without the politics. Mina, how do you react to that? Um, one of the things that comes to mind is how uh, this question of, you know, obviously we need, feminism needs some idea of, of woman as a category, woman as a group, to, 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 have, to not lose its drive. Um, but at the same time, I think there can also be, there's also room within feminism to, to complicate that category. I mean, woman is, is I think that the, the term woman is in many ways a, a male invention, a male project. I mean, Simone de Beauvoir says that, some, something to that as well. Um, and so we need to make space for those conversations. And I guess that might be one of the contributions that Judith Butler in her, I mean, she, she's kind of as obscure maybe as postmodernism is, is, you know, everybody speaks about Judith Butler's theories, but we don't get it partly because she writes in yes. such an obscure way. Um, but I, I wonder if, if that conversation kind of is feminism. You know, this, this engagement with what it is to be a woman. Is it a construct? Is it not? Um, and, you know, as Hilary was saying, this is a conversation, or was saying in terms of postmodernism and language. I think this woman question within feminism is what has been there from the very beginning. You know, when some women were fighting for suffrage, you had others d debating, no, that's not what women do. And it, it's kind of always been about complicating that category. So, yeah. Uh, Hillary, we could conceivably be talking about other damaging schools of philosophy. I don't know. I don't know whether there's a big, uh, where there's a balloon debate about somewhere about which ones you ditch and which ones you wouldn't, and so on. But we're talking about this one. Um, insofar as it has, as it, as it has been influential in the political and wider sphere, do you think it's been beneficial or not? As, as I said at the beginning, I think there are lots of aspects of the way that postmodern applied which are problematic and... Which would they be? Which, sorry? Which would they be? Well, where, where it, it, it looks as if you can simply assert a view in the light of your particular uh, perspective or view and say that is sufficient. It's sufficient that, um, uh, that you have had this experience, you've had this uh, understanding of things, and that's enough. Um, uh, uh, and uh, I think that's a misunderstanding. I, I, you know, the, of course, the key thing that's going on here in our conversation is that I think the notion of truth is theological. That is, I think that the very idea of truth is uh, it functions in the same way as God for a, for a scientific world. It's something that we reach towards but we can't get get at. And I do think it is problematic. And uh, and. And so uh, you only have to look, uh, there are lots of different people who want to assert objective truth, um, uh, but they don't agree on their objective truths. They have radically different views. I mean, uh, Pope Benedict is a, uh, is a deep critic of objective truth. Uh, Liz Truss is a, is a deep critic of postmodernism. I doubt whether she has much in common with Julie's view of the world. Um, and that's the first indication that there's something amiss here, that the people who are most assertive of objective truth, they don't agree. And they don't agree on what their objective truths are. And that points, I think, to what is going on underneath the surface, is that the desire to say it is just true is a desire to just say, I'm right. I've got it right, and there isn't an alternative, and, that's, and to draw a, a close to that conversation. And I don't think we can ever do that. But that doesn't mean to say we don't give up on the key vital bits of the Enlightenment, which were observation, watching to see what the consequences of your account of the world is, and reason, 
looking to see, oh, but that bit doesn't fit with this bit. That doesn't, if you hold that view, you've got to hold this view. That's what we have to double down on. We have to double down on those key things, uh, especially in a situation where we, we've given up on a theological truth. Uh, thanks very much, Hilary. We're tight for time on this one, Julian, before we come on to the kind of what next uh, explosion that we're going, that we're what? going on. What? I'm not going to fold it. So I wanted to ask you this forever, and forgive me, should Foucault Foucault? Oh, <laughs> very good. I like that. Well, look, part of, part of the problem with this is postmodernism in the dock is a title. It really isn't postmodernism. I mean, Foucault never identified as a postmodernist, neither did Derrida. I mean, the, the, the term is used so loosely, it's become sort of almost ridiculous. But the, what I think people have identified as a problem is a certain kind of way in which ideas are filtered down and got current, cu common currency and have various different sources. And it's basically the idea that there, are, there, there is nothing but stories we tell, nothing but the narratives we create ourselves. That's been the real problem. And that does lead to this kind of thing, if I feel it, it's true thing, which is brilliantly parodied in The Simpsons, an episode where Homer Simpson is accused of sexual harassment. And somebody is interviewing a, a witness and she says, I've never seen Homer Simpson. I don't know Homer Simpson. <laughs> I'm sorry. I can't go on. And the presenter says, that's okay. Your tears say far more than any facts could ever do. You know. um, and that, that kind of like primacy of my experience, because if there's, if there's only stories, if there are only narratives, and there's nothing... To continue watching this video, click the link in the top left or in the description below. Or visit iai.tv for more debates and talks from the world's leading thinkers on today's biggest ideas.